everybody and welcome back to the Lotus Guru. Right, we've been looking at the year 2009 now. Now this was a big year for Lotus as it was the year that the Evora was introduced. Now this was the first new car from Lotus since the Elise Mark 1. So it had been quite a time. Now I would get the car that features on the front page of the auto car. This car was actually validation prototype VP1 and I would get this car to use for training. So the first thing I had to do was take the car apart to see how it was put together and then put it back together, write the training notes for the courses to be run for the Evora and that was the end of that car. By the time we'd finished with it, it had been taken apart quite a few times and the Lotus does not like being taken apart a lot of times and put back together. So when I finished with it, it was in a pretty sorry state. The car eventually got sold on and was used as a platform for a race car. While we're talking about the Evora, I will be doing a complete episode on the Evora from its inception right up to the current model range now. But I'll be giving you an insight into what went on with the design of the car, how the car developed into the car that it is now. So you can look forward to that and I think probably that will be the first feature that I do in this series. Training wise I was doing a lot of courses obviously on the Evora, the Evora introduction which is a one day course and a three day general maintenance course where we took the car, front and rear clamshells off, looked at our car in detail and quite a good uptake on this for all the guys from the UK and Europe so that, that was a pretty successful course. Another course that I run in 2009 was the fitting of the supercharger to the Elise and Exige with two ZZ engines. This was quite successful as well. Lots of people from the UK and Europe wanted to come on this course because it was a good upgrade for the car and could easily be sold to the customers. Now another interesting project I was involved with in 2009 didn't have anything to do with Lotus cars. Neil Turner had been approached by Ian Smith, squadron leader Ian Smith, who was the officer commanding Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Now we knew Ian back in the days from Ket Hall. He owned a couple of Lotus, he used to bring his cars in to us for him to service. At the time when he came in at Ket Hall, he was flying with the Red Arrows in position Red 8. So both Neil and I love the Red Arrows, who doesn't? So we formed a bit of a friendship with Old Smithy, as we called him, and it was really good. Now, to promote the anniversary of the Battle of Britain, which would come up in 2010, the Imperial War Museum had donated a replica Spitfire to the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, and it would be taken on a tour of the UK to commemorate the anniversary. Now, the problem with this replica was um, it needed a few repairs, and as it was made of fiberglass, Smithy thought Lotus would be a good firm to sort it out. Now, as I'm a bit of an aviation enthusiast, particularly Second World War aircraft, Neil dispatched me to Duxford to go and do a survey on the aircraft and look at the type of repairs that it may need doing to it. I arrived at Duxford and I was shown to where the aircraft was located in one of the display hangars. Um, much to my surprise, this Spitfire was a replica of a Mark 9. Now, any of you that know anything about Spitfires will know that during the Battle of Britain, it was the Mark 1s and 2s that were used during the battle. Now, there are quite a few differences between these two marks of Spitfires. The main differences between the Mark 9 and the Mark 2, which we were trying to achieve, was in the wing areas, also, the four-bladed propeller, we needed a three-bladed propeller, and the gun layer on the wings. So looking at the wings, we had to get rid of the cannon fairings and the blisters because the Mark 9 Spitfire with the E-type wing had four cannons, where the A-type wing on the Mark II Spitfire had eight Browning machine guns. So there would need to be a lot of stuff removed from the wings to make it look like a Mark IIa. The other problem we had on the wings was on the underside of the wings. The 
The Mark 9 has two large radiator housings, whereas the Mark 2 or the Mark 1s have one radiator housing and a small cylindrical oil cooler located underneath the port wing. Now our problem to replicate the oil cooler is we needed a pattern for this. This is where Smithy came to the rescue. The Battle of Britain Memorial Flights Mark IIa Spitfire was currently being worked on at the Aircraft Restoration Company based at Duxford. So myself and Mark Lloyd from the Tool Room went down there to have a look at this Spitfire to see what we could do with it. Mark and I arrived at Duxford and we were shown into the ARC's hangar by John Romain. He's the director of the company, he owns the company and he's also a very, very good display pilot. He couldn't do enough to help us, which was really helpful. So Mark took a splash mold of the oil cooler that's underneath the wing on the Mark IIa and we had our pattern for us to fabricate this one to put on the replica. Now the aircraft we used for the splash mold is Spitfire P7350. This is the oldest airworthy Spitfire in the world and the only one still remaining that actually took part in the Battle of Britain. It had been used in the film The Battle of Britain where it had been restored to flying condition for the film. It was then donated to the Battle of Britain Memorial Fire as a memorial to all those pilots that took part in the Battle of Britain. So our work was done at Duxford, off we went back to Hethel. All we had to wait for now was for the replica to be transported to Hethel to have the work carried out on. Smithy arranged for Royal Air Force MT to transport the Spitfire down to Hethel on two low loaders. We got the date when it was going to arrive. Neil Turner and I managed to prod PR into action where we could give a bit of support for this because it's local interest. So Neil and I went down and met the small convoy with two Evoras to escort it to Hethel. And here's Neil and I on the bridge over the A11 waiting for that convoy to arrive. The aircraft arrived safely, I'm glad to say. I was, was unloaded around the back of Factory 3. Now this did generate a bit of interest. The local television company came down, BBC Look East, did a little feature with Neil Turner and it also featured in the Eastern Daily Press. So Lotus got a good bit of advertising out of this and it didn't really cost us anything. So once we'd done our bit and the aircraft was all finished and the guys in the tool room done a bloody brilliant job on it I must say, RFMT came down, picked up the aircraft again and it was taken down to Vintage Fabrics down in Essex where they would paint the aircraft in the period colours of the time of the Battle of Britain and they did an absolutely superb job on it. She was now ready to take her tour of the UK and the aircraft's name was Molly which funnily enough is my mother's name. So she went around the country as on display as the aircraft to commemorate the anniversary of the Battle of Britain. There's a few little interesting facts for you, if you are interested in, hopefully you are. The aircraft was finished in the markings of 41 Squadron. This aircraft was flown by Sergeant Philip David Lloyd, who was sadly shot down and killed during the Battle of Britain. Incidentally, Smithy actually flew Jaguars from RF Coltishall in Norfolk with 41 Squadron and was involved in missions over Bosnia and during the Gulf War. The aircraft now resides at the Imperial War Museum and I think the colour scheme has been changed but if you go there and look at a Mark IIa Spitfire that isn't a Mark IIa Spitfire, that's the one that Lotus did. It was an interesting project to be involved with. I'm proud of the work that Lotus did on the Spitfire and it's nice that that aircraft went around the country as a commemoration to all those pilots who lost their lives during the Battle of Britain. And as always, Lotus had a few limited editions that came out in 2009. Let's have a quick look at these.
So we're nearly at the end of 2009. In December, I fly out to Australia to run some training for the guys out there. And in 2009, Danny Bahar is appointed as a new CEO at Lotus Cars. Now I think there probably could be a whole program on Danny Bahar's time at Lotus and I will put some work into that. So we're now entering 2010. Another interesting year. Um, I go to America twice this year to run courses on the Evora and also the Supercharger Fitting course. In March, I go out to Doha in Qatar to set up our new dealer there. Yeah, it was interesting, I must say. Then following that, I'm sent out to Chile to set up a new dealer in Santiago. Now, Chile, obviously, not a destination you go to on holiday. Well, not many people would anyway. Um, probably the worst thing about it is the 13 and a half hour flight down to Chile. That was a long flight on an old A340. It was very tiring. Now in September, Gary, Andy French, Paul Bing and myself go to Seville for the press launch of the Evora S and IPS. This is a nice event. We used a track and it had a mounting course as well. We had various different other cars from Mercedes, from BMW, Nissan and a Jaguar XK and we drove the cars and compared them with the Evora. Now on the track, the Evora was by far the best car and on the mountain roads, it was the best car as well. Probably the most fun car on the track was the Jaguar XK. It was like driving a gentleman's club cross between a boat. To say it didn't handle as well as the Evora is an understatement. Now the after event dinner in the evening in a very nice restaurant with all of us lot from Lotus, plus all the dealer salespeople, it was a good event. There was much food eaten and there was much beer drunk. It was a good night. And that's the end of 2010. Right, we'll move on now to 2011. After sales, we're on the move again. Danny Behar at Earmark Factory 3, where we was at the time, to be the production plant for the new Esprit. So we had to move out. We moved to Longwater Business Park in Norwich. We had a nice large warehouse for all the parts and a smaller warehouse next door which could be used for slower moving parts like clamshells and stuff like that, but also for me to set up a brand new training facility. There was already a small room that could be converted into a nice little classroom. Um, the workshop I had to have constructed. So walls were put up and on this one, I actually had a ceiling or roof on it. So I wasn't open to the rest of the warehouse. When it was finished, it was probably the best training facility that we'd ever had at Lotus. And of course, at Lotus, we had a few more limited editions, Exeges this time, and Evoras. So that's the end of this segment, 2009 to 2011. Hope to see you again for the next one. Until then, stay safe and look after yourself. So long. <laughs>